Well, good evening, and uh, welcome to this uh, longer session today of three hours in which we'll try to learn and put in practice uh, the concepts uh, uh, that we learned uh, in last week with Luigi about uh, web applications. Okay, so we'll try to move forward, starting from the initial idea of uh, the main building block. Uh, blocks uh, of uh, web applications like the browser, the server, the HTML in between, and the HTTP protocol, uh, we'll try to see how that can be uh, implemented using uh, uh, Python. So we'll start small again, and then we'll, in the next weeks, uh, we'll add no more features, uh, we'll uh, learn new capabilities for creating more, say, complete and modern web applications, okay? And uh, uh, we are using, of course, uh, uh, Python for, for, for this task. And so the goal would be creating, uh, uh, okay, simple web application. So this is not a web uh, uh, development course, uh, but nevertheless, we need uh, to be able to create some sort of uh, interface uh, for our users uh, to see, uh, input some data, to so visualize some uh, outputs and so on. So something quite simple in general compared to you know, big name uh, web applications, uh, but uh, uh, we need to master web technologies. At the same time, we are going to discover that uh, uh, the web technologies are not just used for creating interactive applications. Well, I would say that today it's, a, it's not a minor point, but uh, it's only one of the um, type of applications that we create with the HTML, HTTP, and so on, because most of the uh, new applications also rely on uh, HTTP, so web technologies in general, for creating server-side components. So we will use, uh, we will reuse what, what we learn about web technologies also for creating a, a, a mechanism for integrating and letting different parts of our project to communicate. So basically, if you have two computers, how do they exchange information? So you could use any, you know, network protocol to let two different machines uh, to exchange information, but actually a very effective and uh, simple and fast way to do that uh, is using, uh, reusing HTTP and using all the, the software that you already have in web applications. So for now, we will start simple. We'll start creating a simple web, web application with, with the, the user in mind, with the user interaction in mind. But later we'll see that most of that, especially the server side, is also useful for letting uh, computer exchange information. So the, there will no longer be any browser or a user connected to that. Uh, there would be a computer talking to another computer, exchange it uh, to another computer uh, with the same HTTP protocol that regular browsers use. Hmm? But we'll get there. Uh, of course, we don't need to implement the HTTP protocol by hand. We'll try to learn a couple of libraries or frameworks uh, that will uh, do most of the job for us. So that we'll, we'll only have to focus on creating the web content and not managing the whole uh, infrastructure. Hmm? And uh, so this is uh, the goal. And the first step would be, OK, but uh, how can we program a web application with Python? So if you go to a bookstore and say, OK, let me sh show me the sector about uh, books for programming web, uh, web applications, most of the time uh, this sector will be about PHP. Uh, the PHP language, or in some case JavaScript, Node.js, uh, there are some languages, some frameworks uh, that are more popular as languages for building web applications. Python is not one of the most popular ones, but okay, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be used, uh, and there are some also uh, important libraries for doing that. Actually, in the standard library, in the standard Python library, there is already one simple class called the simple HTTP server that, as the name says, uh, already implements uh, the server side of the HTTP protocol. What is the server side of the HTTP protocol? It's something that is able to listen for new messages of type HTTP request that will come from different browsers, and is able to reply with an HTTP response message. Okay? The, the HTTP server has, has only that single goal in its life listen for HTTP requests and uh, analyze each of them and respond with a HTTP response message. Hmm? 
So this is already in the standard library, but uh, it doesn't have many features. It's quite raw to, to use. It's quite uh, close to the protocol. During the years, people started developing different types of uh, frameworks or libraries that in some way extend that simple GP server with new functionality that makes uh, uh, developing a uh, web application easier and faster for the, the average programmer. So for example, you find Cherry Pie, there is another framework which we call Flask and Pyramid and Django. Uh, and as you, as you proceed with this uh, sort of uh, arrow, complexity increases. So probably today, if you have to, if you want to work in Python, and if you had to build a complete web application, web portal with all the user logins and uh, all the, um, you know, uh, social aspects and uh, a lot of uh, functionalities, probably Django would be a good choice hmm? because it already has a lot of uh, features defined by default and so that you just only have to, to add your own logic. Hmm? But uh, it also imposes, so the more complex frameworks also help you in developing classical web applications, but also some sort of impose you a way of programming. So they force you to work uh, in the way the framework is designed to work, no? which is quite natural. But, uh, and so it will help you in the common case of uh, creating a large application, but in some ways too complex for our simple needs. Hmm? So for us, it would be better to use a, a simpler framework, which is, uh, let's say, closer to the HTTP protocol, but uh, so it doesn't impose any style of programming. It's very it's simple to use. Of course, uh, it will be more difficult if you, if you want to create a very complex application, which is lost in, in most of the cases is not uh, our goal. And so in this course, we select uh, this one, Flask, which is a very simple framework to start with. So the basic functions are very easy, very simple, very basic, I would say also. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it has a system of plugins in which you can add new functionality by installing new, installing new packages. So you create with a very simple web application with a very few capabilities. And if you need it, you can add the new modules, the Python modules, that will enrich that application with new functions, uh, new functionality, new capabilities for handling the login, for example, for handling the bootstrap team, for handling uh, uh, form validation, and a lot of normal features that are required in complex applications. So in, they are not inside the Flask core, rather they are, they are extensions of the Flask library. So in, the, in this way, you can sort of uh, select which extensions you want and uh, package a web application which has just enough features for what you need. Hmm? So let's go into, okay, these are just a sample. Uh, if you go to this web page, you will find that uh, there are probably 25, 30, 40 different libraries or frameworks that can be used for developing uh, uh, web applications. And each of them, it is more, it's more or less features, it's, more, it's simpler, it's more complex, uh, and especially it has more or less uh, documentation, which is a key point here. More or less a web server only does a simple job, uh, responding to web requests, to HTTP requests. Uh, but if, if you are trying to do something uh, and maybe you need to find uh, or to debug some, some issue, uh, it's a very important po point is having a good documentation and a good community behind that so that you can find people on Stack Overflow <laughs> that, uh, that already had the same problem and you, find, you can find the answers. Huh? So uh, it's always a very important aspect to, to evaluate, not just the technology, but also the support from the developers and for the community. So what is Flask? Um, Actually, if you want to know more, uh, the, the two main sources are the Flask website. And uh, if you would prefer reading something on paper, there's also a, a, a doc book uh, here uh, by O'Reilly uh, about Flask web development, uh, which where the first chapters are, are useful. Huh? But um, the Flask website, uh, website is, uh, if I remember correctly, it's flask.org, which is this strange name, uh, that has a very simple uh, tutorial or very simple examples. 
and uh, uh, you also have all the read the documentation part here so it's not just one page with uh, an example but if you go to the documentation website it's quite extensive into the docs folder here and you have a tutorial a quick start uh, and especially an api section so you have both uh, the tutorial that will tell you step by step uh, how to do user guide uh, uh, the different step of the tu tutorials and the different uh, features that are described so you see that it's quite a complete documentation and in parallel to that you have the apis that are the technical documentation about the functions and the objects defined in this module hmm? so you will usually work by reading the part of the tutorial of the documentation and uh, getting all the details about the parameters and the functionality in the api hmm? just to um, to get started so docs and uh, docs slash api are the two main pages reference material for what we are trying to do um, if you read the documentation it's a bit cryptic uh, because it says that uh, okay flask is the union of, th of three different uh, technologies three different packages one is uh, the web server itself so actually the flask library doesn't contain the http server it uses another module that does this job okay so it includes another module which is called in this way don't ask me to pronounce it because i wouldn't know where to start from uh, this w something is the web server module okay um, and uh, that is uh, we don't need to see it in some because it's already included in flask but uh, in some cases uh, the documentation just points you to uh, some specific method some specific, specific, uh, specific function into this uh, web server so this is the module that really does the http that manages the http connection hmm? flask is on top of that and gi will give you a not a user friendly but a programmer friendly a programmer friendly environment in which to create uh, these applications the uh, second module is called uh, people like strange names jinja2 if or or a similar pronunciation uh, this on the right is the logo i don't know whether this uh, pictogram means anything in any language on earth or it's just nice to see or it's just a, uh, you know an oriental sounding name maybe some of you can help me and uh, uh, I don't know why it's called Jinja 2, but because there is no Jinja 1, uh, but uh, it's okay. Uh, this is a module that uh, we will use, which is, call, which is used for templating, managing templates of HTML pages. What happens is that if you are creating a website, many web pages <coughs> contain similar portions. So if you are creating a website with many pages, all of them will have the menu at the top uh, will have probably the, the navigation bar on the left uh, will have the same footer and so on but the content will vary will change from page to page so it's very useful to have a way of specifying page templates to a part of the html of the page that doesn't change and a part that will change according to the current uh, page or the current uh, status of the variable uh, you could do, do that, uh, we will try to do that with uh, string composition, string formatting, string concatenation, but it's very painful. So uh, this uh, Jinja library is something that will help us uh, with uh, reusing parts uh, of HTML pages uh, and uh, uh, making them dynamic. So inserting into the HTML template, into the HTML skeleton of a page, the specific content in the right place. So it's, a, uh, it's not really part uh, of the HTTP server, but it's some, uh, some helper, let's say, library that will help us to create uh, dynamically a complete HTML file. So this, uh, with this in mind, uh, so the installation of Flask uh, and uh, the other two 
elements, uh, W something and ginger2, is uh, uh, simply a uh, pip install uh, command. Okay? Uh, or if you are using PyCharm, uh, if you create a new project, a new Flash project, PyCharm will automatically install them for you into the local environment if you have the, the permissions to do that. And that's it. We, you only need to install this uh, small library, uh, unless you want to do that into a virtual environment because you don't want to install it at the system level. But And uh, what is the structure of a web application in Flask? Um, a web application is a simple object of type uh, Flask with a capital S. So the, the, the main thing we should do is to create an object that represents our web application. This is a statement uh, that will go into our main Python file. Application equal Flask with a string parameter. This string will be the name of the application. So in many cases, you use the underscore name uh, uh, macro variable because uh, the name of the application would be the name of the Python file. Uh, I use, it's, it's usually if you have more than one application running so you can you know, tell which is which. Um, this is something we didn't really cover from the Python syntax. Uh, Flask is the name of a class and in Python this syntax, name of a class, parenthesis, is the um, object instantiation operator, like in Java it will be new, okay? If you're creating a new object of type Flask, uh, of type Flask. So the object is up lowercase here. So we are creating a new object of type uh, Flask. This new object is, embeds the web server. We need, of course, to start the web server. So we need to call the method run onto the app uh, instance of the Flask application. So our web application is an object that is already defined into the package, the Flask uh, package. We just need to import it. And we need just to run. When you write, say run, the web server will start. Right now the web server will start, but doesn't know what is the content of our website. So we should in some way extend this basic web server to instruct it to explain to this web server what are the, the pages that compose our website. Right now, it's a, it will be a web server that doesn't have any response. For every request, it will tell you 404, page not found, huh? because any request doesn't uh, know how to map a request into a response. Our job would be to extend this application with uh, new information about, okay, if the user asks for this address, then the response should be this one. Uh, by default, when you run a, a Flask application, it will uh, run the web server on the local host, so 127.0.0.1 IP address, on a special port, on a free port, which is the 5000 uh, port. Uh, so you, to, to see the content of your website, you should uh, point your browser you open a browser and point it to this address, uh, localhost, uh, um, semicolon 5000. This is good for developing, for debugging. Of course, if you want, but this web server is only visible from inside your computer. So you cannot connect to the web server running on my computer because it's only, it's only published on the localhost. It's only published on the local interface, which is isolated from the internet. If you want that the website will be published outside so it could be visible to other clients, to other browsers that happen to know the, the IP address or the name of my computer, you should instruct the application to run and bind it to all the IP addresses on this computer. So host equals 0000 means the web server should be reachable by all the internet interfaces in this computer, not just the local host, the internal interface, but also the Wi-Fi or the, or the Ethernet connection and so on. So on all the IP addresses assigned to this computer, 
the web server will listen and respond to the request. So if you want to make it publicly accessible, when you finish developing it and you, you are putting that on your Raspberry, <laughs> you want to run a client that points to that Raspberry. So first of all, that computer should listen to a, your request, not just listen to the internal ones. In that case, you will he need to specify that the host uh, is any host, any IP address. Hmm? So this zero is a fake address that says that just a wildcard for saying any address. And you just register to this machine. And uh, probably you could also want to publish the website on port 80, which is the default HTTP port, so that users don't need to say, to, to write uh, semicolon 5000, but just the name of the computer. Um, and so you can specify on which port and on which addresses should the application run. We do that only when we want to run actually the web server to the public. In development phase, we don't need to do that. But on the other hand, in the development phase, we could uh, add that this debug is true parameter to the application.run method that will instruct the web server to be more verbose, more detailed on uh, possible errors. So we want to have the errors printed when we are debugging, when we are developing, so that we can see what's wrong. Okay? Usually, in a web application, in a real public uh, web application, the errors are not shown to the user. Never. The programming error, the exceptions, and so on. Because uh, showing a, an error may help the user to find uh, weaknesses in our application, and they can exploit that uh, for, for security breaking, hmm? for breaking the security of our system. So normally, um, our server will fail silently if it finds some errors. But in debugging, in developing, we want to see all the errors. So we should uh, start the, 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 the application in a debug mode, hmm? which just means that we'll print more and we show all the errors, hmm? which is really what we want to do for developing. Okay, so these are mm, generally the, 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 the instruction if you want to run on the public interface of your computer. Hmm? If it's not working, probably the, the firewall is blocking your connection because you don't need just to say, please, Flask, uh, listen also on all the IP addresses on this computer, but the packet should first reach the Flask. And so it means that the, the local firewall should not block uh, this port 80 and so on. So it's sort of a say, network configuration of the machine to be able uh, to be seen on the, on the web or on the internet. Um, okay, but this for startup or uh, say commu initial communication. Then once the application is started, we need to create content for the website. So uh, in Flask, every page is a function. So the main page of the website uh, could be a function that we call the index, for example. It's the name of the page. This name is associated, is published on a given URI, on a given address. So, for example, the, in, the index will be published to the slash, to the top, to the root page, to the root address of our website. So, uh, th we have this uh, annotation, which is called app.root, route. The app uh, prefix uh, refers to the app object that we created. So remember, you, we created an, the application, we called it app, and I said that we need to extend it to provide content. Okay, this is the way we extend it. We are saying, okay, this dear application, please add a new route for incoming requests. If a new request comes into this address, request for this page, which is the root page of the website, then route it to this function. So give a route, uh, the, the request to this function that will take care of it. So a lot of functions, one function defined for every page of our website, 
the function will receive a request coming from a browser and uh, we'll have to produce the HTML page that Flask will deliver in response to the client. Uh, so actually we have these three ingredients. The URL, the address at which we want to publish the page, which is the argument of the route annotation. The name of the page, which is the name of the function, which is totally free, it's an internal name, users will not see it. The users will see the address, not the internal name. And the content of the page, which should be a string containing the HTML code for that page. And uh, that's it, basically. So if we want to try it, we can create a first application of just one page. So we go to PyCharm. You can create a new project. I call it uh, Python Web. And I select uh, it uh, as a Flask project. So it's not a normal Python project, it will be a Flask project. The first time you do, you do it, you will see that PyCharm will, uh, will uh, install all the Flask and W something and Jinja packages for you. So I Python dash web. And there are some options uh, where uh, you can use uh, different templating languages or templating engines. Uh, we use Jinja, so it's okay for us in this case. You know, we, don't, we don't need to touch these settings. And so we can ask uh, PyCharm to create an empty web project for us. And you see that it creates three, the, so the empty project or the start project is composed of three different uh, items. One is the web application itself. It's a Python file that imports Flask, creates the application, and runs it. And already defines uh, for our convenience, uh, so that we can copy and paste, uh, an initial page. Routing the slash address onto the hello world function. And this hello world function will uh, produce a text, uh, a string text uh, called hello world. This is not yet uh, an HTML page because it's not HTML head, body, and something, just a string. Okay, so it's not really a web page yet, but it's something to start with. Then it will contain two further directories, or the project contains two further directory, and we see in a moment uh, what they are used for. One is called templates, and the other is called pages, pages. So in a couple of words, uh, the template directory will contain, as the name says, the HTML templates that we can use to compose the pages, to help us with the composition of the string corresponding to a full page, so that we can edit them elsewhere and not here ins inside of this uh, uh, string. And the static uh, will contain, as the name says again, uh, the static content for the website. So, for example, a page will have to link to an image, a picture. So, returning a picture from a Python code is not very intelligent. The picture is already a file on the computer, the JPEG file, for example, the PNG file. <coughs> so, we have a directory in which we can dump all the files, PNG, JPEG, uh, uh, style sheets, uh, PDFs, uh, um, all the material that just has to be downloaded doesn't require any interaction, doesn't require to be dynamically created. So all the static content of a, of a website. So the static content will be mainly images, style sheets, JavaScript files, and uh, documents to download, like a PDF or something like that, or a zip file. So we can dump there in the static directory so that they can be published by 
flask without an intervention. We don't need to route them explicitly one, one by one, okay? They are already routed to the static directory. So what happens when we start this uh, application? Maybe we want to modify it uh, with debug uh, true so that we don't forget it for later. So we can save and run. So it should be enabled after a while. So you first need to check all the package or the installation, but while I was talking, PyCharm was working. And if I run it, it's telling me that uh, this application is starting. The debugger is active because I put debug equal to true. And the web server is now running on this address as expected. So if we click on this address, a browser opens, and you see that this is our address, and the page that requested is slash, the root page, and the contents come out as hello world. And uh, what does Flask say? It says, that, okay, yeah, on this server, at this date, 6th of April, 1644, I received the request of type get, so it's an HTTP command get, for the page of address slash. The address of this page is the root page. With a protocol, with a client, the browser, with a protocol HTTP 1.1. And this 200 is the return code, is the HTTP return code saying, okay, the request was satisfied without error. And satisfying the request means uh, returning this content to the browser, then will then show it to the user. At the same time, if we try to request a different page, slash hello, this to the server, Are you doing? Something is wrong because I should see the request down here. So let's start it again. Okay. I don't know why I didn't print. So if I request this page, a page that hasn't been defined yet, the browser will give me an error. And the server will tell me, okay, at this time and hour, I received a request for slash hello.html, and it doesn't exist, so I reply with a 404 error, page not found. 200 is the code for okay, request uh, satisfied, and 404 is the call for error, page not found error. So page not found in flex means that I found no applicable route for satisfying that specific request. So if I wanted to create a page, a resource that responds at this address, I can add a new route to the application. So to this application, we add a new route to the page hello.html slash. And we do that by defining a function and this function would return return a real HTML page, another HTML page, for example, the real hello page. So I save this page. Very often when I save, when I change something, I need to rerun the server. 
So in some cases, uh, Flask is able to detect that I modified something, but in many cases it doesn't, so it's better before trying to request the page again to restart, uh, just need to click here, the application. And now if I refresh this page, I will find the real hello page because right now, hello.html is a request, this is a valid request because there is a route associated with that request. And that route is mapped to the function and the function is able to produce an output. So the page is returned and uh, the web server is uh, happy and returns 200 like the success code for this HTTP request. So basically, for creating a website, we have just to define all the name of the pages that we want to publish with their address, all internal functions corresponding to those pages, and all the HTML content of every page. Okay, but you say this is not HTML. Yes, it's not. The real HTML is uh, it's longer. So you should have... Uh, Probably it's easier if we create a, a multi-line string and uh, we define the HTML page. With a head. With a title. And with a body, with all the proper HTML text. So that when this page is called, actually the web browser, web server will return a string. It always returns a string. But in this case, this string will look like an HTML page and not just a, a normal text. And the browser will be happy for that. And it will be happy to, oh no, uh, it was Internet Explorer. And it will be happy to format the page for us according to the HTML text. So this is a title, this is a paragraph, the fonts are changed and so on. So we create the pages as strings in our application. You can understand how painful it is. Okay? Uh, writing the HTML inside the string is something that is really error prone. You can make mistakes everywhere. Especially if you start uh, trying to add parameters to this page. So imagine you need to include the function, a value here. So, for example, uh, you, you compute uh, a value which is uh, 3 plus 2, for example, to very complex computation, and you want to include the value here. The value is slash p. We should include the, 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 re the result of the computation value in this point here in the code. Of, all, of course, we cannot write value because that would print the literal string V-A-L-U-E because it's part of the string. We need to escape this, so exit from the string, from the multi-line string, concatenate value, and then concatenating the rest of the string. And it works. The readability but 
it works because we are composing a, an HTML page by concatenating three segments, three strings. The first string from here to this point, up to this point, and second string is the string representation of, the, of five, and the third string is this one. All of three are combined and returned to the browser. And the browser will happily, I hope, Okay, it doesn't. So this is an example of an error thrown by the debugger. So this page it will not be shown uh, if the debug was false, if we didn't put the debug true. In that case, it helps us to identify the error in our code. And the error says that the type must be string, not integer. And my fault. And concatenating strings and integers. So I need first to convert the integer into a string and then concatenate it. Sorry. And it tells me where the error happens. In the, the error, of course, is raised inside the Flask library. Blah, 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 because actually we are calling app methods. But our fault is in Python web.py line 21. And so it points me to the line where the error happens. By the way, this is why you don't want users to see these errors. First, because they won't understand anything and they will think your application is crazy. But also because uh, you are disclosing the source code of the application. They will see it. And if they see where the application crashes, uh, then one millisecond later, they will uh, be able to exploit it. And so this is the message you can use uh, for, for, in our case, it's very simple. We need to put a string str uh, uh, call in, uh, around the value. But what I wanted to show you also is that uh, if you hover onto one of these lines, especially this one, you have a, a, a small console icon there. So this is a, it's a, it's a, um, it's an advanced debug functionality. So we are in the browser, remember. The browser fired an error, an exception, and we, we can click on this icon and it will uh, ask me for a code. The code is the code that Flask printed out when it started here. This code here will change every time. If I paste this code here, I will have, uh, what is that? Here, access to a console. You see there, console ready. So in the browser, so while I'm seeing the developer, the Flask application is stopped in the point where the error was generated. And so you can say, okay, but well, what's wrong? If I, what's the value? It, where is that? Value is five. Uh, what is the type of value? Ah, it's an integer, and so on. So I can interact from the browser with the running program. Like in the normal debugger, if, if you are debugging something into PyCharm, you can stop the execution, give commands, uh, and inspect the variables and so on. Right now, we, you cannot do that, really, because you are not the, the user of the application. The, the browser is. But with this trick, uh, we can understand better what's happening. In our case, it's very simple. We just need to stringify this value. Save, restart, reload, and be happy. The value is five. From the point of view of the browser, there is no difference between this code or putting directly a five here. The browser will receive the same string. All the burden is on the server. The server needs to create a string in the proper way by putting together all the pieces. Some pieces will be constant. They don't change. Some pieces will be variable. 
they change according to what the application is doing. And we need to put them together and ensure that the resulting string is a valid HTML file. But apart from that, uh, we can do the same for the other page. So we can also modify the main page. Let's call it index or the, the main page or the root page and uh, website home page let's call it home why not and uh, home page and we can ask the user whether if you want to see the value see the secret value click here so we are doing the same work on an another page so at this point if I reload the root page the home page we have an HTML not just a text with uh, to see this secret value click here and click here of course is not clickable yet because we need to put an HTML link into the HTML page and uh, the link would be linking a href is uh, hello dot HTML close the quotes close the tag slash a So we are putting a link on the page and we transform this page into this normal text into link using the A uh, tag. And if I click here, of course, I will be directed, re the, the browser will request. Uh, so initially I requested, where is that running? Okay. I requested the root page. And then by clicking on the link, uh, the browser requested the hello page and both succeed. And so it can navigate through the page and so on. Uh, again, we need to be careful because this is a, a Python string that contains inside an HTML string. So these quotes are not the Python quotes, are the HTML quotes. So we need to be careful whether we are inside or outside the string, uh, what uh, we are opening, what we are closing. So it, it requires a bit of, uh, of mangling there. Okay. So um, if we go back to the slides, just imagine this is a, as another example, we'll try to do that with our, you know, uh, toy example, pro toy project example. We, what we did is to create two different pages. One is the home page and the other is the hello page. We call them like that. And we put into one page uh, a link to the other. So we created a link on one page that links to the second and we could do, we could do the same for going back to the home page. And the actual code that we brought is something that looks like this. Okay, so this is uh, just a slide with a similar program that does exactly the same thing. We have text, we have in this case images and so on. All the images are served from a source uh, equals static slash name of the file. You remember the static directory in the project that will contain all the static files. If you need to use one of these files, link to one of these files in your HTML code, just call them from the static slash. Static, the static prefix, the static directory will route automatically all the requests to the static directory. Hmm? Okay, 
uh, and we are putting uh, links and so on. Actually, there's something I don't like too much, which is uh, encoding the destination links into the string, into the HTML string. So in our example, we have this hello.html string here. which is fine because that is the address of that page. But what happens if, uh, no, but it's not, it's not really a hello page, it's a secret number page here. So it would be a real, reveal the secret because everything evolves. Okay, so our website will add new pages, will change existing ones and so on. So in this case, I change the route to this page, I change the address because we are, I am maybe moving or restructuring the website, and therefore I would like to change also all the references to that page. I can't do that if it's embedded in a string. So, but what I could do is to compute this address dynamically by asking the Flask uh, framework what is the, the URL, what is the address for a given page by giving the page name. So the page name is the function, is the function name, so hello. So I could ask what is, so I need to go out and in again from the string and concatenate URL for uh, Hello. URL4 needs to be imported, probably. At the top, okay, to work. So I imported URL4 there. So right now I'm not encoding slash hello.htm at the path of a given resource in the pages that links to it, but I'm uh, asking to determine dynamically the URL from the page name. And uh, remember the name of a page is the name of the function that implements it. So again, we have the game of the quotes. This quote is an opening quote in HTML for the attribute href. This triple tick, uh, sorry, is the closing quote in Python for the first fragment of the page. This is an opening quote in Python for generating this string that is passed as an argument to the URL for. And this string is closed here. The ho whole function call returns a string that is then concatenated with uh, the rest of the multi-line string. There is one too many quotes here. There should be three, not four. Three. And uh, the beginning of the string, so inside the Python string, there will be a closing quote for the HTML href tag. Keep calm and count the quotes always. Uh, and balance the quotes. Reload. And what happens is that uh, we load the web page, click here, and you see that it's, right now we don't call hello but secret.html because we change the name and the name is dynamically computed. So as long as we keep what counts, which is the names of the functions, everything adjusts itself if, uh, even if we move or restructure the, the content of the website. So it's better for us because the site in some way is able to evolve, but at the same time is more complex because we need every time we have a link uh, to play this game. And the same goes for the other page. The value is this one, and go back to the home page. So we have uh, 
a link to the home page should play the same then. So href out from the string URL for um, the name of the function is uh, home and then close the quote sorry we re begin the quote and uh, close the href home slash a slash b the chance of making html errors here is 100% HTML that, that, gone, that won't be detected by Python, won't be detected by uh, PyCharm, because PyCharm, sorry, PyCharm, um, Flask doesn't care about the HTML, doesn't understand the HTML. It just returns strings. It's the browser who cares about HTML. And so the server doesn't, isn't, is not able to detect HTML syntax errors. Only the, in the browser, the page will look weird, will look, will look strange, and so that will tell us there will be a, some HTML mistake. So this is what we are doing, very simple. If we need to link not to a dynamically generated page, but to a static file, uh, the only difference is that instead of the name of the page, which is the name of the, of the def function, we put static with the second parameter, file name equal to. Okay, so we, if we want to add an image, uh, let's pick uh, any image. What, what image do you like? Um, I don't know. Let's see what happens. Okay, this one. Great. I save this file. No, save, no, no link. Save image with a name. And I want to save it. into the project, so let me save it uh, here. And uh, from here, we drag it into the static directory of the project. So we added we, this image here onto the static directory. And we want to link this image onto our web page at the beginning of the page, close to the title. So for example, we have an image, source, equal, the address of the, sorry, equal, the address of the page here. And maybe this image uh, is too large, we want to make it smaller. Let's see if it works. I'm not sure I got the right height, type. I always get work. And we need to point to the image, which is in the static directory, which is a static file, nothing dynamic about this. It's the same file all over, uh, over and over again. So we need to put the address at which that file can be retrieved through HTTP. So again, same old game, six quotes, not seven, one, two, three, five, four, six, okay. Double plus URL four, Static file name is that file name? Yes, file name. File term which is two. File name equal uh, secret dash five twelve dot png.
Okay. So let's see what happens now. I modify the home page, I guess. No, the secret page. Okay, you see there our image, which is probably too small. So we change it to 40. And maybe we want to do the same on the other page. So it's not just here, but also on the home page. On the title, we want to add the image and a space. Rerun. Okay, on page of secret to see the secret value, click here and go there and so on. So every time we must link uh, from one page to another or we must include an image or other static content, we always use the URL4 method. Uh, which is able to compose the URL for us and so adapt to the locations where the pages are or where the static resources are. Okay, probably you start feeling the pain uh, of creating HTML into strings. If the page becomes complex, I need to add, insert, inject the right content into the right places as strings, uh, do all the conversions. I don't see any syntax highlighting uh, that helps me. So this H1, did I close it properly? I don't know. I need to check by hand. Okay, I, I closed it. But usually, you know, uh, I expect the pie charm to highlight the matching text, uh, highlight in red syntax errors, or something like that. It can't because it's just a string for it. And every time I have some dynamic uh, content, like our value or, or the URLs or so, we need to play the game of the quotes uh, in order to get everything correct. So is there a better way? Yes, it is. There is. So um, we need first, you know, before going forward with the basic flash function, we need first to have a look uh, at the templates, template mechanism. Because templates are the mechanism that will help us avoid all these complexities. Okay, so we jump ahead uh, some slides, then we will go back and say, okay, I cannot do anything more complex than this in this way, really. It's impossible to manage. So let's start to separate the complexity of the application from the complexity of the pages, separating the HTML from the code, separating Python from HTML and use some glue mechanism to put them together again automatically. So I will design the page in HTML. I will design the code, the Python code, the computation of the value and so on in Python. And then I will just ask this uh, templating engine, put them together. Hmm? Uh, so we don't, we will never ever again create an HTML page into a string. Okay, that was just for us to understand how Flask is working, uh, the basic mechanism for returning strings, uh, but we don't want to build the strings ourselves. Never, ever. We use uh, some sort of uh, creation mechanism. And the creation mechanism will depend uh, on what kind of page we need to return. When we need to return HTML code, we'll, we will use this uh, Jinja 2 templating engine. Later on, we'll discover that in some cases we want to return some other file format, like JSON data. At that point, we will use another mechanism for creating JSON file. But we will never create those strings uh, ourselves. And uh, what's a templating engine? It's something that takes a template, so a model of how the page should look like, and uh, customizes it 
by inserting, injecting in proper places some values defined by the programmer. So a template is an HTML page which is not yet complete, it's not final. It, all, it still has some, some undefined parts. And when I interpolate the template, uh, when I instantiate the template, what I'm doing is that I'm inserting in the empty spot of the template the actual values that are determined by, by the code. Um, how, how does it work? Well, quite simply, we put all the templates uh, into the template subfolder in our project. We call them with an HTML file, uh, HTML file extension. So I will call them uh, home.html and secret.html. The name might be the same as the URL, but should not in general. Hmm? It might be, it might not be, depending on us, hmm? whether we give the same name or not. They are, they are disjoint, same space. And uh, the magic uh, operation is given by this uh, render template uh, call. A render template call takes as argument a template name, the name of a template, file that we put into the template directory, and returns a string composed of the HTML content plus some parameters that are being inserted. And this string can be returned by Flask to the browser. And uh, the parameters of a template uh, are passed uh, to the render template called in, as normal parameters in the function call. Name of the parameter equal value of the parameter and so on. And these names can be used uh, inside the HTML code with this strange syntax, double curly braces. In the double braces mark the point when a dynamic value is inserted. And the render template method will identify all the parameters and replace those strange curl, double curly um, structure with the actual value of the variable being specified down there in the render template call. Then it's much more powerful than this, but let's start from the beginning. So what we are saying is that we don't want to do this. So instead of uh, defining the home page as a string, we create in the template directory an HTML file called, uh, for example, home.html. And uh, this would be the content of the page. We, so we replace it with our page head to the body, copy, go there, and paste it to here. Okay. And what I see is that right now the file has an HTML extension, and PyCharm will help me writing the HTML code. It colors, it matches the text, uh, it uh, finds syntax errors, and so on. Uh, so HTML, meta, h1. OK, right now we still have this, uh, you see it's uh, highlighted in yellow because it's an error in HTML. We still have, uh, let's delete them. We still have some parameters. So right now, we have a normal HTML page, which we know still has uh, a couple of spots that need to be filled. So for example, here, we need to fill uh, a URL, and uh, what is that? Also here in this image, we need to fill them. 
but apart from that we can replace this ugly string with a very simple return uh, what's the call render template on.html and the template of course needs to be added here it includes run a template of uh, home uh, sorry quotes on the HTML and all of this can be deleted Uh, how do we insert the URL for commands into the template? We can do that easily with the double curly braces syntax. So if we have some segments of dynamic code, we can inject it, insert it with a placeholder into the template. So this was the, sorry, what's that? The image URL for blah 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 copy and we paste it here and the same goes for the link to the other page URL for The name of the page is, uh, you see that uh, it's intelligent so that if we, if we do control space to complete, uh, it already knows which are the functions that can be inserted here. So in this case, it's, uh, to see that, it's called hello instead of secret. So we can throw away all the ugly parts, go away and have a much cleaner web application where we only see the logic, the navigation. Right now there is no logic here, it's just showing a page. And separately, we see the content, the structure, the layout of the page. So we do it here. We can do it also for the other page. Let's call it secret and then see what happens. HTML, and then we pick the title from here, put it there, take the body, put it there, we replace this with the, the placeholder syntax. And uh, here, we so right now we just I just replaced the, the links and the URLs. We still have to replace this uh, value. This is the nicest part because I just have to put uh, the secret value, a name here. Okay, I this placeholder as a name, secret value. This will be filled with a value called the secret value in the uh, template call. So in this case, we have to call render template of a template name uh, secret. And to it, we should pass the secret value parameter with the value value let's delete it so you see what's happening we have some value some real value 
and we want to inject it into some specific place in a web page. So in the web page, we mark uh, that specific page, uh, place where we want that value to appear with a placeholder. And we give a name to that placeholder, a variable name, actually. This name is populated, is initialized with the value of a parameter, equally named parameter, in the render template call. So it says that what it says really is um, analyze this template and replace all the placeholders, there may be more than one, call the secret value with a given value here, which happens to be five. We had just computed it. So our templates are actually that, our templates that will be filled with the specific values. Right now it's very simple, but. So we see all the logic of the application here and all the layout and content of the application there. And uh, this is just Python code. This is just HTML code with placeholders. So also the editor, PyCharm, is clever enough uh, to do the right syntax and to help us, of course, for development. So if we run uh, the applications again from the beginning, probably nothing changes. Nothing changes, of course, from the user point of view. The value is still 5, and we can still navigate through the different pages. But we are doing that in a very more friendly context, in a much more friendly context, uh, because it's uh, easy to write. We don't have to do all this. And all the string concatenation is done with these placeholders. Inside the placeholders, we have a limited uh, Python syntax available. So we can also do some computations there. If we need it, we, uh, we have some small constructs uh, that we'll, we'll learn in a minute uh, to um, create the page better. So for example, if we have a, col a Python collection, we can iterate through the elements of the collection to create a table, for example, of a list of items. Just imagine your to-do list. Your to-do list in a collection, you pass the collection to the page, and the page will iterate. We have a for loop inside here. So the page will also be, let's say, the template of the page will also be intelligent to show the data. We will have a minimum of, of intelligence to show the data. But we are separating the intelligence of uh, adapting the template, uh, which is inside the HTML, from the intelligence of computing the data, which is in the Python code. Okay? So right now we, we can do much more than this because uh, our pages are, in a way, static. Okay, uh, so I would like a, a page that computes a value. If I enter a number, I will compute the double of the number, for example. But I don't have, right now, we don't know how to input data from the user. Uh, to make something useful, it's not a web page with a set of pages that are always identical. The pages should react to the values entered by the user. So the next step would be, right now we, are, we, are, we, we have a confident environment in which we can work. The next step would be to add interaction to this environment. We do that after the break, if you agree. Okay, so 15 minutes or we start again at, at five, uh, uh, 5.50.